Words can be and often are weapons of mass destruction. Roy, idle words, and stone fruit? All of this and more is coming up on Quick Study. We're on the air. Stay there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. And this is the Quick Study Television Program, and we are absolutely thrilled that you decided to join us today as we go through the Book of Wisdom. I feel like there should be like a, a, a crash Sound of effect. orchestra. The mm -hmm. Book of Wisdom. And wisdom. An echo. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and uh, it is too. Actually, it's an amazing book called <laughs> Proverbs. And we're going to be focusing today on Proverbs as we go through the Bible. It's Proverbs 13 to 15. What we're going to learn is this words can be, and often are, weapons of mass destruction. More damage is done with words than with a bomb. And I'll prove that a little bit later on as we talk about it in the teaching segment. And that's what the Bible says too. And the Bible is set, of course, in history. We have a historical faith mm -hmm. here to help us understand that with archaeology is Corey. Okay. We are going to be looking at an ivory pomegranate that possibly was used in the Temple of Solomon and hmm. also education 3,000 years ago. I think I've seen this. Did we see this in we Ottawa? Saw this. Yeah. We saw oh, this. it's yes. really cool. Stay around for this one. <laughs> okay, Bible challenges. Also very cool. Yes. According to Proverbs, what does idle chatter lead to? Poverty, death, or wickedness? All right, Corey, you're going to have to answer that question based okay. on our reading today. Okay. Okay, based on our reading today. Today. In, in, confined in today's Proverbs reading. Proverbs 13 through 15. That's right. All right, get out your Bibles and study with us. It is time to continue through the Bible. Here we go. In the mid-1500s, Queen Mary banned all the reformed traditions, and these reformer works brought great strength to the Word of God and the Church. But Queen Mary murdered and burned over 300 men and women and children related to the revival of the Bible in English and the reform of the Church. It earned her the notorious and infamous title, Bloody Mary. Now, the Bible throughout the centuries has often offended the corridors of human political thinking with the truth of God's power and authority over the minds of men and women. Get your quick study pocket guide. Go through the Bible with us. Write P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. We are viewer supported, and if you'd be kind enough to pray about what God would have you do, remember we are supported by gifts from people just like you. Again, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. continue our journey through the book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament of the Bible. Now, you should know that the book of Proverbs was written by King Solomon of Israel. Now, King Solomon is the famous son of King David, the idyllic king of Israel. Now, what I want to take a look uh, with you right now at is an artifact, a very tiny artifact that was found not too long ago that archeologists have claimed might have come from this time period of King Solomon may have been used in fact, in the most famous building in all of history, the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. The pomegranate is a fruit native to Asia. It grows in clusters on a small tree or shrub. It is the symbolism behind this fruit that has become intriguing. 
references to pomegranates in the Bible are not scarce. In Exodus, we learn that pictures of pomegranates were embroidered along the bottom hem of priest robes. These priests were those serving in the tent of meeting at the time of Moses. We also learn in 2 Chronicles 4, 13, that 400 decorative pomegranates were kept in the temple Solomon built for the Lord. In Numbers 13, 23, spies were sent out to look at the Promised Land. They brought back grapes, pomegranates, and figs to demonstrate the fertility of the land. The idea of representing fertility goes further when we look at Canaanite culture. Their cult of the goddess Ashtoreth utilized the pomegranate in its imagery. In recent history, archaeologists unearthed an anciently carved ivory pomegranate. This small symbol has an inscription around its top reading, belonging to the temple of the Lord, holy to the priests. Is this one of the 400 pomegranates kept in Solomon's temple? The first dating of this object was based on the inscription said to have been from 800 years before Christ. Researchers now claim the object is much older, 1400 years before Christ. Well, the writing, they say, is from the later date. Well, today, continuing with the self-evident truths and the reality commands of Proverbs 13 to 15, the collection of wise sayings intensifies on every level. Proverbs 13 tends to compare lifestyles between the foolish and the wise. Proverbs 14 speaks of relationships, while Proverbs 15 starts out with the most obvious yet frequently ignored truth. A soft answer turns away wrath. Proverbs 13, verses 1 through 7. A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. A righteous man hates lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and comes to shame. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. Proverbs chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. As we continue to go through the Bible, and as we work our way through the book of Proverbs, uh, again, I want to remind all of us that uh, the word knowledge, for example, that Proverbs uses, it doesn't simply refer to the ability to know or some kind of talent in memorizing. No, it's not it. It's not about skills in determining. Rather, it means something far more. This word intimates that the skill of perception is in play, the ability to see what is invisible to the present circumstance. That's knowledge. So God promises to give knowledge to those who seek Him and who ask for it. Knowledge from God seems to be that ability, listen to the word now, to discern the circumstance that we are in on all levels, emotional, spiritual, and physical. And so the Proverbs promises us to, actually promises to give us a different look. Now, uh, when you go in, uh, when I had uh, my arm broken, and uh, I, for lots of different reasons, I won't get into that because it's a long story, but I had my arm broken, and they, they, what they did is they brought a camera in, and they took a picture. And all of a sudden, I saw things inside I could not see on the outside. And I saw lots of different things inside. And that's like God's knowledge. God's knowledge is, okay, there's your circumstance, and then there's what's inside or behind the circumstance. 
And so God promises that that's what knowledge is. Knowledge is understanding what's driving the circumstance. Knowledge is understanding who's behind it spiritually. Knowledge is understanding all of that. It is literally a gift of knowledge. Very important. And the Bible, this is the great part. Proverbs promises that we can have knowledge, that wonderful, beautiful gift from heaven, if we seek it like we do our own paycheck. Now that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Now let's bring this to Proverbs 13, 1 and 2. It says this, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Verse 2, A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds violence. Now here we see as we apply this knowledge from the Proverbs that Words are powerful tools of construction or destruction. What are your words like? I say this and, and uh, I enjoy doing this because I did it myself and it even, it scared me tremendously. Uh, I preach at uh, Good Friends Fellowship. It's our church. Come and see us sometime in the summer, by the way. Our services are at 9 and 11. We're in Orangeville, Ontario, uh, just come north of Toronto. But I, I preach and I say, let, let's, let's say, for example, I could take a, a recording device. And I could put it on you, and it records every single word that you said all week long. And then it's going to send all your words to be analyzed. And then, of course, you can see people are going, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have said this. It becomes rather, rather distressing, doesn't it? And so we learn here from the Proverbs that that's what's happening. God understands everything we say, and he pays attention to everything we say. But so does Satan. And with our words, we release things. With our sarcasm, with our doubt, with our all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, anger and everything, we release things. But with our praise and with our thank you, Lord, even though I'm going through a hard time, I'm still going to praise you. We release things. We release healing or we release, release cursing. Now, that's why Proverbs 13, 3 says this. Here's what it says. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens it wide... His lips shall have destruction. You know, uh, the second truth to live by, one of the most important disciplines of being successful is our ability to shut up. <laughs> I have a great friend uh, who's a lawyer, and uh, he, he'll make you nervous because as you're sitting talking to him, he just listens, and he doesn't talk back, and pretty soon you, you're like, is something wrong. You become, it's actually a technique and you become nervous because it's so unusual to hear somebody just listen anymore. And so we learn, beloved, today it's very important for us to develop self-control over our mouth if we're going to be successful, especially if we're going to be successful witnesses of Jesus Christ. But there's more. Proverbs goes on to say in 13.4, the soul of a lazy man always desires. He has nothing. But you know, the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. So you know what? The truth to live by number three. If we work, we will eat and be satisfied. If we are lazy and slack, we will eat at someone else's hand and never be satisfied. You know what the problem is with the lotteries? You didn't work for that money. Everybody wants to win a million dollars and they think, oh, a million dollars, but just had a million dollars, all my trouble will go away, brother and sister. My beloved, the troubles are just beginning. You just you give money that you never worked for, you get money you never worked for. I got news for you. That money's going to make you work for it. And you can track it throughout history. You see, God assigns money and he assigns provision to those he has chosen. And what is important for us to remember is that as we are diligent, in other words, as we love to work, as we put our mind to it and say, we're going to do this like Paul says to the church, we're going to do this as unto Christ. As we work, work is good. Work is good. Hard work is good. And the Bible says you will be rewarded for hard work. It is good to work hard. It is not good to, to think that you're entitled to everything. It is good to work for your sustenance. That is a principle that comes directly from the Bible.
The book of Proverbs speaks often about the attributes of the wise person. It speaks of the tongue of the wise or the life of the wise or the words of the wise and what those individual things do. It's trying to help us identify what the wise person looks like so that we too can change our lives so that we can be wise, so that we can come to the Lord and learn what his wisdom really is. Now, we have this idea in, in today's culture that it's only been recently where human beings have, you know, really valued education. But from my studies in history, it has become abundantly clear that that idea is very backwards. The ancient world was very focused on wisdom and wisdom literature and education itself. So, Take a look with me. We're gonna go back in time and we're gonna look at ancient education. Taking examples from old Babylonian literature, we are able to learn much about ancient education, specifically the education of the scribe. Scribes were men with high positions in society. They were respected and their level of education was widely acknowledged. These Babylonian scribes spoke wrote and read their common language Akkadian. And they were also required to learn, speak, and write the culture's scholarly language, Sumerian. They wrote translation dictionaries to become proficient in the languages. They had to learn business management. They studied economics, math, and law. Scribes were taught to be extremely precise and once trained, were required to prepare various contracts for social transactions. In scribal education, there was even a tutoring system. The advanced students earned the nickname Big Brothers as their new responsibility became helping the newer students succeed. Study Television and Bible Discovery TV present a TV special called Cultures and Creeds on DVD. Corey and Ryan Hembry examined the ancient cultures in the Bible and the creeds they respected in order to understand the context and the spiritual mood in which the Bible figures encountered God. Cultures and Creeds with Corey and Ryan Hembry brings you ancient history, Bible archaeology, stunning revelations about the way in which God confronted every culture and creed in every generation throughout time. This is part two in a 12-part TV series just out of the edit suite. Discover just how relevant the Bible really is today by understanding how God encountered the past generations. To receive your own DVD TV special called Cultures and Creeds, we suggest a donation of $20 or more. You can write with your donation to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. In the United States, you can write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156680150. To call with a credit card, 1-519-940-8338 or 724-733-8336. Amazing truth. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. 
Stories of dragons are found almost on every continent. In libraries around the world, there are many old books and stories that have detailed records of dragons and their encounters with the armies of men. The most famous paintings illustrating the story of St. George, who lived from 250 to 300 AD, show the armies of men driving spears into the dragon. Genesis chapter one clearly says that God created the great beast of the earth. These ancient dragons were nonetheless ancient dinosaurs living with man. and making decisions should never be casual in a sense of apathy. Now, the Bible teaches us to care and to take care about everything we do. Proverbs 3 tells us how to do that. Simply acknowledge God in everything we do, as if he has put us in this situation. And the Proverbs teaches that the earth is full of spiritual pits and emotional minds. It warns that we can be trapped in them if we do not pay attention. Now to be alert beyond emotion, beyond emotion is the wise thing to do and how we should be when we encounter life. Now the amazing truth is that we see, what we see is not what we get. There is much more going on beneath the surface of our circumstances than we can humanly detect. And this is one of the great tragedies of today's culture is we want things fast, we want them quick. We live in a headline world and we don't want to pay attention. We've forgotten how to think. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs, think about what you're doing. As a matter of fact, in all your ways, acknowledge him. The word acknowledge there means consider with him. Mm -hmm. In all your ways, consider with God. That's and right. he then will direct your paths. What would you say then, Rod, to someone who says, but there's so many little details. God, God's far too busy to be concerned about the little details in my you, life. You don't understand God. I've heard God. that a lot. No, you don't understand God. If God's not concerned about the details, do a little brief study on the cell, the human cell, and you'll find a whole lot to do with the details. God has every detail of the molecule in your body he's concerned with. And so, no, he is not. Every little detail. He just wants to talk to you. He just wants you to consider with him. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He will direct your paths. Bible challenge. Here it is. According to Proverbs, what does idle chatter lead to? Poverty, death, or wickedness? I believe the answer to that one is poverty. Let's read it. Proverbs 14, verse 23. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Well, that, this, I got a great, I, listen, I have a great question for this particular Bible IQ question, okay? And again, okay. we didn't synchronize this, but the Lord did. Watch this question. It's a very interesting question. It comes in from a friend of mine on Facebook. Here's what he says. Rod, uh, about your Bible Investigators program, I think when people ask questions in your Bible Investigator show, it brings too much trouble. Why don't you just preach to us? That's better. And that's what he says. Now, uh, in some ways, he's right in this sense, that some people just want to hear themselves talk. Mm -hmm. They just want attention. But in other ways, people have true questions. And the folks mm -hmm. are going to frame a question in a way that I wouldn't necessarily preach it. But in their mind, it's framed that way. We do a, once every six weeks, we do ask the pastor at our church. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason we do it. We do it so that people can ask questions and frame the questions in their way. And we try to filter out those who just want attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are always those who want to preach and you know, they just want attention and, and get some kind of pulpit of their own. Asking questions is good, though. And it as, is. As a little child, that's how you learn. Everybody remembers the going through the stages of the why mom, why dad stage. Mm -hmm. and, and as we're learning and we all learn together, it's important to ask questions. And it's part of temple yeah. worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it helps you to really fully understand an issue because exactly. you might preach something and I may not understand fully one mm -hmm. concept in that. So it helps if I'm able to challenge that. Okay, well then what about this? What about that? Exactly. So that you can get a full rounded knowledge of, of a concept. And it brings us to a, a iron sharpens iron. That's, that's the idea anyway. Let me show you a clip from Bible and investigators so you can get a feel of our topical Bible study on video. Here it is. 
What's the story behind God's story? Inspired by the Creator, written by 40 authors over 1,500 years. We can get a look into the story of God. Scripture contains many different types of literary devices and writing styles. So how do we know when we are reading Scripture correctly? What happens when we misquote Scripture or take things out of its frame of reference? Can we understand the context of a book that is more than 2,000 years old? This subject and more being tackled on Bible Investigators at www.biblediscoverytv.com. Go to Bible Investigators at www.biblediscoverytv.com. Okay, that's what we handle, the topical Bible study on Bible mm -hmm. Investigators. When do we do that, Janice? 8.30 p.m. every Sunday night, Eastern Standard Time on www.biblediscoverytv.com. But what if they can't make it on Sunday night, Corey? Can they watch it online somewhere? They sure can. It's, it's archived as well on biblediscoverytv.com. All of the topics that we've done there so far, you can just click on a topic and watch it. And of course, uh, BibleDiscoveryTV.com is the same as the StreamTV.com, and these are all presentations for you. By the way, we set a record last month, over 300,000 downloads uh, of the show just on those particular uh, sites. And so I want to thank you for that. But also remember this, it's the same ministry as Quick Study Television, and we are supported only by viewers just like you. So if you're watching Quick Study right now on the internet, uh, did you know that uh, your help is just as important? That somebody's actually paid so we can have this program on the internet? So we actually ask you to consider becoming a partner. You can do so by clicking on the donate button just to the right of me or the left of me here. In the meantime, here is Watch and Pray. Let's join with these folks. The thing about the Bible is it speaks of a God who doesn't just sit around and think about things, but actually does things. And that's what he did to relieve us of sin. I mean, look, about, look around the world, think about it. Beautiful animals ripping each other apart just to stay alive. Cancer, disease, sickness. Did God create this and say this is good? No. This is a result of sin. Man kicked God off the planet years ago, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God acted. He did something for you and for me. He did something to give us a fresh start, to say you don't have to fall victim to all that past. We can create a new future together, God says to you right now. He says we can create a new future. I will give you eternal life. I'll give you a new life. That is through Jesus Christ. He died on the cross and rose again for you. So my question to you is, why not join heaven today? Come to Jesus Christ. Start again. Hey, thank you for joining us today on the Quick Study Television program. If you're watching on your iPad as a podcast, thank you for downloading over 25,000 downloads. And we're looking for 200 new digital internet partners. Will you be one of them? Pray about it and ask God what he would have you do. Give an offering in any amount, go to the website and click on Donate Now.